So welcome to our presentation on, yeah, thank you, yeah. <laughs> uh, finding shelter through peer support. Um, I come from the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. Uh, Sarah, one fifth of the people here also comes from the, <laughs> the Western Mass RLC. Um, and so before we start, I just want to tell you a little bit about how this, uh, this kind of thing started for us. Um, we were at some threat of having our budget cut by DMH. And uh, one of the things they said during a meeting was that if you had a housing, like part of what you did, that you wouldn't be in danger. And I don't know if they actually meant that, but I think they knew we didn't. Um, so at that time, we were working with a local social justice uh, organization uh, called the Rise for Social Justice. Um, and we were doing these tenants' rights meetings. And uh, the first one we did, we got 100 people. So we immediately scheduled another one, and nobody showed up which, you know, that's not always fun, as you can tell today. Um, but we actually had like a really good dialogue. And one of the things that Mike Land talked, Mike Land Busey is the director of Arise, was that um, she was the president of the board of directors of a place called the Rainville, which is a, a housing, it's just a big brick building uh, with 46 units of uh, efficiency apartments for people who are homeless. Um, the only qualifier to get in is to be homeless. It's 30% of your income. And if you don't have an income, it's only $50 a month. They had been contracting with a traditional provider to get wraparound services for a really long time, but it wasn't a lot of money for them. So they would come in and do a coffee hour and then leave. Um, so they asked if we'd be interested in it. And uh, I thought we might, uh, but I didn't actually know what that would look like. And uh, here we are about two, almost two and a half years later and we've been working in that building. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through uh, so in Massachusetts, it's uh, SROs is de are defined as apartments that, um, SRO just means only one person can live there. And that's actually a federal qualification. Um, single resident occupancy, um, that's an SRO. Uh, efficiency just means small, basically. It's a really nice way of saying they're very small apartments. Yeah, the state minimum is 111 square feet. Um, the building actually used to be kind of a rundown hotel. So there are some rooms that are really a lot bigger than that, almost 200 square feet. And there are some rooms that are, they like had to cut a closet in to make it 111 square feet. Uh, some of the, the rooms are really small. It's arbitrary which one you get. Um, so what is the Western Mass RLC? Um, yeah, so we're a community of people. Uh, Kind of the caveat is that everybody who works for us has their own experience with trauma, um, whatever that might be for them. Um, for me, a part of my story is being homeless. Um, and we do peer support. Uh, we have people who go into hospitals and offer support there. We have a peer run respite, which was actually really helpful in us to ter in getting into this because we, we knew people stayed there for overnight. So we were able to take some of the things we did when we worked with people uh, in a place where you know you couldn't just ask them to kind of leave for the day, so uh, feels really helpful. Uh, some of the common beliefs have folks have about people is that uh, if someone wants to find a shelter bed, one is usually available if they know where to look. I just want to pause there for a second and say that Massachusetts is the only state in the country that is a right to shelter state. Um, so actually, by law, there is supposed to be a shelter bed for you. Um, there's a lot of caveats in that. Uh, to get into a homeless shelter in our state, uh, they run your Cori check, they run your background check. So they, a police officer uh, runs your driver's license. So if you might have a warrant, you're not going to the shelter. You have to have an in-state license. So if you are coming from another state, um, you will not be able to access the shelter until you change your license over, which costs $100, which is pretty substantial if you are homeless in our city. Um, and the shelters vary widely in their range. Uh, in the place we live in, there's one place called uh, the Samaritan Inn, which is a really beautiful facility. Um, they have a nurse uh, who specializes in uh, people with opiate uh, issues. Um, they're the most handicap accessible space. Everybody gets an actual bed and you can stay there during the day, which is huge. They will not take anybody who has ever taken a psychiatric medication. Um, so I tell you how nice it is and then I tell you that most of the folks we're working with can't access it. Uh, and then it goes to the Worthington Street Shelter, which is our local cot shelter. Um, in the middle of winter, you'll have about three to 400 people there. And it is actual, the blue cots, you know, the old, uh, about two feet off the floor. And you will be, uh, people, you're ash cheek to ash cheek. You are as close to another human being as you are comfortable being. 
uh, people have been murdered uh, in front of the building. Uh, women have to check in much earlier in the day. Uh, women have to be there uh, in there by seven o'clock. So if you miss that check-in time, you aren't able to access the space. Uh, men come in at nine. Uh, and if someone does not like you, there's a police officer there. Uh, the police have made it their business that if there's an assault that happens, they will walk both participants out to the street and then turn around. So people are often assaulted again. So you think about the options for folks. There's not a lot of options, so we do have a lot of folks who are, are homeless. Um, and that's not, that's not to even talk about the domestic violence situation. Um, the last time I was looking for a DV shelter for someone, uh, we were in Western Mass. The closest bed I could find was in New York. Uh, there was nothing in Connecticut or, or uh, anywhere close enough. Shelters typically provide humane options for getting off the street. No, they're gross. They're really, really gross. And uh, they have outbreaks of bed bugs routinely, uh, staph infections. Uh, we have uh, a very high rate of staph infections in our homeless population. And because they don't, aren't able to access medical supports, they often get to really, really bad points, um, including I know someone who lost uh, part of an arm to a staph infection. Uh, the, they don't bleach things very often, so the stuff is really, really not great. Um, Homeless shelters don't discriminate based on psychiatric history. Absolutely, uh, that is not true. Uh, in Massachusetts, they're able, to, they're able to ask you some questions, and then like most places where they're able to ask questions, they insert one about mental health stuff, and they've gotten really insidious. It used to be, you know, do you have a diagnosis? Now it's, do you take any medications? The reason they take for not accepting you is that they can't maintain your medication, which is stupid, because it's not true. Um, that they would need to give you your medication if you had them. Um, but it also, they don't uh, discriminate if you're even on the medication right now. So if you tell them, no, I took a medication when I was 12, that will also discriminate, that would also keep you out. Um, our biggest fight with that was a, a young man who was 21 when he came to us, who had stopped taking medication when he was 12, uh, and was not allowed into the shelter until we had a very kind of public, messy fight with them. So. Uh, and homelessness is usually due to psychiatric diagnosis or problems with substance abuse. Um, that's a thing I really think is important to challenge. Um, I think that being homeless is traumatic. It is inherently traumatic. Um, in our area, in the summer, you will be kicked out of shady spots because those are parks where we want people who have money to eat their lunches. So you're kind of constantly being pushed out of where you are. Um, when I was homeless, and I, I was homeless in the city, um, we have a big park like most cities do. Ours is called Forest Park. Um, and in that park, there are hundreds of people sleeping at night. Um, and the things that happen in that park are pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, you can also imagine the things people do to not be homeless anymore, which is uh, there's a lot of women who participate in like really sketchy sexual situations, but if it guarantees housing, then it, that's kind of part of it. Um, we've had guys who have taken basically slave labor jobs, uh, working on you know roofs all summer, just so that they can have a place to go indoors. Um, do some people have emotional distress when they get there? Is that the cause of it for some folks? Absolutely. Um, when you leave a hospital, it can be very hard to find a place to go. Um, but actually, most of the folks I work with, um, the trauma that is like at the center of what we're talking about is the actual reality of being on the streets and kind of being at the mercy of many people. Uh, really quickly in our city, there was an initiative to do a tent city. A church did it on their grounds. It was a really, really well-intentioned, really great thing. Hundreds of people were there. There was no violence on that ground. Uh, there was no narcotics. People understood that we had to keep that stuff out for it to happen. And regardless of that, the mayor had the police come in and burn all the tents. Um, and so it was this huge fire that was uh, it, just a big fire. And also it was really metaphorical and important for people to know that they weren't welcomed in the city. Um, so those are some. Do people have other preconceptions of homeless folks? There's lots of them, right? And we'll get into more of that. Some of the reasons we see people end up homeless, uh, lack of affordable housing. In the city we live in, they're building a billion dollar casino. They were supposed to build uh, 100 units of uh, affordable housing. Uh, at the last second, they decided that they weren't gonna be able to do that, uh, but they had halfway built the billion dollar casino, so nobody held them to it. Um, an efficiency apartment, I was talking to the 111 square feet apartment in downtown Springfield, goes for $650 a month. Um, so if you're getting SSDI or any of those things, it is the vast majority of your income. Um, 
And affordable housing is in most places commonly defined as about 30% of your income. We know that a lot of folks pay more than that, but a lot of the people we see, that I see on a daily basis, are paying closer to 80% of their income, which means they buy less food, they're able to do less with their children, uh, and often pushes people to really sketchy situations. Uh, racist and other discriminatory housing practices. Uh, this is a big one, so where we're at, we have a lot of uh, folks from Puerto Rico. Uh, Holyoke, which is kind of like a town over, is uh, the highest percentage of people from Puerto Rico outside of Puerto Rico in the country. Uh, it's, a really, it's where I live, it's a really beautiful city. Um, but lots of landlords uh, do not want people of color, uh, poor people in their units. So we actually just had a big uh, HUD case where they came in and found people guilty of discrimination for not taking people's Section 8 vouchers because they didn't speak English, they didn't have any of their paperwork in Spanish, and their answer to not having it in Spanish was to say, you're not qualified for this uh, place because you don't speak English. Uh, that's actually a violation of federal law. Um, I think it's helpful to insert here that we have some of the best laws in, in Massachusetts. Uh, we're a tenant's rights state, so if you go to court, it skews automatically towards the tenant. Uh, evictions take a long time. Even if you're, you're terrible, and that sometimes happens, uh, it usually takes a few months before you're actually out. In the winter, if you have a child under the age of two, or you have a disability, or you're over the age of 65, you cannot be evicted in the middle of winter. They will not evict you. Uh, they'll wait till it warms up. Uh, and you also can't have your power shut off. Um, so those are really important things to know. I spent some time last night looking up the laws here, and it's very different. Um, it, yeah, so in our, in our state, you establish tenancy by spending a night. If you have someone come into your house and sleep in a room, and they intend to stay there for longer, that first night establishes the tenancy. You still have to evict them. That can be really annoying if you have a terrible friend, but it can be really useful for people. And we also, it's one of the reasons they outlawed uh, boarding houses, so you can't have boarding houses where we're at. I just say that to say some of the things I'm gonna talk about are gonna sound super uh, privileged because they are kind of lucky in that. It's still awful. Uh, loss of job. A lot of folks are working seasonal jobs. That's a huge thing where we're at. Uh, we have amusement parks and things like that. Uh, people lose a job. They, people aren't able to save up ahead of time, so losing your income is, is the end of the line as far as housing. Uh, serious health issues, costs. Um, you know, prescriptions are expensive for folks. Uh, natural disasters, we actually had a tornado uh, come through our city, and unfortunately it cut a path straight through some of the poorest neighborhoods. And those folks who were displaced um, were pushed into worse neighborhoods than the ones they were in. Um, and in a lot of situations, in the cohabitation situations, so you'll see sometimes like 10 or 12 people living in a, like a two or three bedroom house uh, because there's not a lot of options. Um, Kicked out of family home for being queer, trans, et cetera. Uh, that's a huge one for us. There's actually one city where those folks tend to be a little bit safer, which is Northampton, Mass. Um, but it happens all the time, and it's, it's just unfortunate. Fleeing child abuse and fleeing an abusive partner. Uh, important statistics to know are that 90% of women who are homeless are homeless because of those two reasons. They're fleeing serious violence, serious abuse. Um, and that is one of the reasons why it can be hard to engage them in like shelters, traditional shelters, because they don't want to resurface, right? You don't want to show your face, you don't want people to start to know where you are, uh, and you're not really safe in those places. People have any questions about that last one? Cool, you guys got it. Uh, some of the barriers to find a, finding housing uh, is, the lack of affordable housing is a big one. Um, some of the things we've seen that they've done to, to really make that a, a problem for folks is, um, we have a YMCA in our city. They have a housing piece. Um, they have to be 30% of your income because they're a federal grant. So what they did is they raised the minimum income up. So you have to make $1,200 a month to move in there, which clearly means if you're getting social security, you're not qualified to live there. Um, racist and other discriminatory rental and waitlisting practices. Um, it is illegal to ask for additional fees in Massachusetts besides uh, first month security, uh, in the last, like kind of last months. Those three things are all you can ask for. But there's one landlord place that every month you want to stay on their wait list, they charge you $50. Um, and there's a few places that do that. So, um, yeah, if they don't want kids. Uh, service animals are a huge one. Uh, they don't want your dog. They make up laws about it. Uh, and people just don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
No, they just lie to the person. So it, it, it would just be like, you know, most of the folks going in there don't have the time to read housing law. And so they just don't know. Um, one of the things we see a lot is a 14 day notice to quit means nothing. It just means I intend to take you to court. I intend to end your tenancy. But a lot of times they'll say, hey, if you're not gone in these 14 days, I'll have the sheriff here. Somebody doesn't have the time to go to the courthouse and ask if that can happen. All they know is if I don't leave in these 14 days, I think the police are coming. So it really does create a, you, people just lie. Landlords lie all the time. Um, one of the things that's not up here but just happened recently is we actually had a, a property manager stab someone for being behind on their rent. So there's also now like kind of the threat of violence. Um, but yeah, people just lie and people are uninformed, unfortunately. Yeah. Massachusetts is a little bit better on that, like I'd say a little bit, which is basically our Department of Transitional Assistance is split into two pieces. There is the regular Department of Transitional Assistance, which a single person walks into. The reality is they can almost never help you. They can sign you up for food stamps, they can sign you up for insurance, but they almost can never help you. And then there's the family one, which they have the money to help you, and whether they choose to or not is uh, really a matter of if they like you. Um, and when I say that, I mean, in Massachusetts, here's bad Massachusetts law. In Massachusetts, you can be removed from a subsidized wait list for being scary for two years. So me as the person who's sitting there, if I interpret you as scary, I put a mark into your record and you are removed from the, the state sponsored wait list. Um, so another area where people with emotional distress, imagine uh, context for that is our section eight wait list, wait list is 13 years. So imagine that you've been on this wait list for about six or seven years and you're not feeling so good about it, and you go in there and you say, hey, I need a place to live. We literally, I, I just met a woman the other day who just moved into, she's been on the wait list. Uh, she got on the wait list a, a couple days after her son was born, and he will start middle school from the apartment she just got off of it. So it's been really long for a really long time. Um, but say you come in there and you go, hey, what happened? Why am I not on the, like, why have I not moved in somewhere? If you raise your voice, if you cry, if you, insinuate that I'm not a professional good person who just wants to help you. Um, I, there's no, I don't have to, I'm not responsible for giving a context for that. I just merely mark in your record that you were intimidating to me and you are removed from the list. There's no appeals process for that. We have a yeah. yeah. It, uh, the, cost to, the cost to house all the homeless people in America permanently is about $30 billion, yeah. and we spend that on like military every year. Another important thing to know is, yeah, another important thing to know is the McKinney Act is the federal definition of homelessness, which uh, was actually a big victory for homeless folks. It uh, basically said that like if you were living in these conditions, that it was a, a victory for children. You, if you had a kid, you had, there had to be a different protocol for housing. So a, a kid who's house, uh, couch surfing, who's spending diff time at different uh, people's houses, is legally homeless. If you're an adult, you're not. In our area, the McKinney Act, in their state, you know, translates that like all federal things. Um, to be eligible for any housing supports, you have to have spent one night in a place unsuitable for human habitation, uh, which is a parking garage, a public park, an emergency room. God forbid you go to the emergency room, you might end up in the hospital. Uh, police station, which you can imagine they're not really happy to have you for the evening. And so it actually forces people into really dangerous situations to then become eligible. Housing first was, was like the, the future, everyone thought it was. Um, the reality is the, it was always set up that you could prove the model and then the federal government would uh, pay for it. The federal money never followed it. So right now, there, we have like in our area some initiatives. They're usually very focused. So we have one city has uh, housing first for 13 youth. Um, we have some areas where we have that for elderly folks, but um, it never picked up steam. And uh, the current situation with Ben Carson being there and him having said, you know, there were a quote from Ben Carson was that public housing should be as uncomfortable as humanly possible uh, so that people wouldn't remain there for very long. So you're looking at a situation where I don't think housing first money is coming for a long time. Uh, really, the, the model is set, the model works but there's no money behind it. And you need money to get those initial units working um, and nobody's given the seed money. The Rainville, which we'll talk about, actually came from a HUD uh, program 23 years ago where they, the government owned all these old buildings and they basically decided, we will sell them to you for a dollar if you have a plan. 
they haven't done that again in 20 years. It was supposed to be a program that happened every four years. It happened once, and then it never happened again, uh, which is unfortunate, because we'll, we'll get into why the Rainville has really worked. I did this presentation in, yeah, I did this presentation in San Diego last year, and it was really similar. There were people at the conference. The last time we did this, actually, at NARPA, someone in the audience was like, I'm homeless, can you help me? And it's really hard, because it is contextual. I know the laws of the, the area I'm in, and uh, I'm still trying to help that person find something. Except there's more money spent in Boston, if you've ever been in Massachusetts. Uh, Western Mass is kind of like the dark side of the map. Um, there's more money in Boston for units. Um, and that's something they're working at. Actually, the opiate thing has actually been helpful in them saying we actually need to balance out the money that it can't, we can't spend 10 times as much money in the Boston area if there's not 10 times as many people. Um, but historically, yeah, that's been absolutely true that Boston just has more resources. But uh, the way that you, before we leave, here's an interesting fact about Boston. Uh, in Boston, if you are, if you go into a shelter out of a jail, you're released from jail. If you end up in a shelter within seven days, uh, in the last few years, there's been a 100% recidivism rate. You will end up back in prison in the next six months. So it's not even like a long-term study. It's like they're seeing guys come. There's nothing for them to move on to. Uh, the other part I'll touch on is um, one of the quandaries of homelessness is that you don't often have access to basic rights you might think of, like a place to go to the bathroom. Uh, and if you go in public, then you become a sex offender. Sex offenders are federally not allowed access to any federal money for housing any money. And if you even start to talk to them about it, they will cut your funding. So at the Rainville, we wanted to figure out if we could at least look at why people were on that list and think about housing them. And we were told absolutely not. That would put every uh, resident at, at risk. So this is the Rainville. Uh, the Rainville used to be called the Hotel Rainville. And it was uh, probably one of the worst buildings in the city. There was lots of drugs and people had been killed there. Um, it was a collaboration between HAP, HUD, uh, a lot of churches uh, donated to it happening. Um, it was created specifically for people who have been homeless. Um, so you have to call, you have to, uh, we go by at risk of the McKinney Act. So if you're, we do, we take applications from people who are in long-term psych units, from people who are in jail, uh, which we're technically, I guess, not supposed to, but uh, whatever. Um, and we are limited by area. So we have applicants now from Vermont, um, when I first got there, our wait list was 16 people because people just kind of didn't know about it. To get it into it before, you had to have a social worker from a local provider organization. Uh, we kind of just took the doors off of it and now we have a, about a 160 person wait list. Um, and that's still really small for, for the area. Um, it offers 46 efficiency units. Rent is as low as $50 a month. Uh, part of the reason for that is they had an actual meeting where actual people decided that was how much you could collect in cans in a month um, and still be able to feed yourself and take care of yourself. Um, and actually, if you look on the side, there's the trash. A lot of people put cans into a big, uh, a big barrel there, and then it's kind of divided evenly amongst the few people who are really struggling. Um, oversight is provided by a board made up of tenants and local social justice leaders. We have two lawyers on the board. Uh, one, Bernie Cohen, is specifically a housing lawyer, and he's somebody who helped to write some legislation about the laws. Um, in Massachusetts, we have housing court, um, which is uh, really, really specific, and those judges are really, really trained. One of the things sketchy landlords will do is try to put your case to criminal court because they, they just evict everyone. They don't really care. You're not, you know, when you're dealing with murders, tenancy isn't a big deal. Um, our board is really, really... Uh, cares about that, so we only send people to housing court and we try not to send them. And then we've been there since 2015, uh, June of 2015. Uh, things we offer are one-on-one -on -one peer support. Um, we just meet with people. We have open hours there. We're there five hours a week, so we go to a community room and people can uh, access us if they want. Sometimes you just sit there. Um, that can look like a lot of things. Uh, we've Since I've been there, three people have passed. Um, we supported their families, uh, supported their uh, loved ones to make uh, any efforts they could and also supported the rest of the building. Uh, we've had groups, including a uh, restorative justice circle, which was really interesting for folks who had never really heard that. It was uh, maybe the most uh, fucks I've ever heard in a restorative justice circle, but it was, uh, it was interesting. We are able to provide mediation between tenants, which is really important. Um, the clearest way people get evicted is if you hit someone, which you'd be surprised. It's, people are on top of each other. 
You ever live in a place where you can hear your neighbor? You start to hate your neighbor after a while, no matter how good of a person you are. And um, the first person who ever moved into the building is there. So we have somebody who's been there for 20 years. I would say about a quarter of the building has been there longer than 10 years. And the rest are really new people who have been homeless for a while. And so sometimes it takes a while to adjust. Um, so we do a lot of that. Uh, we do barbecues and uh, things like, uh, we'll talk about it, the health insurance and relevant services. We combined those two when we first got there. Uh, housing, uh, insurance in Massachusetts is, uh, has been around for a lot longer than the rest of the country, uh, but we still had 40% of the building didn't have uh, insurance. And so we started to sign people up for health insurance, which wasn't that hard. They were gonna pay a local mental health provider to do that, and they were gonna split our money up, but we were able to do it in a month. And uh, we also got the neighborhood. So when we would do these insurance things, we would open it up to anybody who lived around there to come. So one of the things I'm really proud of is the whole street has health insurance now, which is probably the first time ever. Um, and like we know people's kids, I know people's kids, we go to, I've gone to birthday parties for kids. We really do try to help the building bridge to the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, assistance in developing payment plans and navigating housing court. That's a big one. Uh, when I first got there, that wasn't necessarily part of our deal, but they would do three month payment plans. And so people would agree to them and then they couldn't conceivably pay their rent. So they would be evicted. Um, so we do that now. We make uh, year long payment plans. You can imagine if your rent is like 240, which is often where people reside, you can pay it off really slowly over a whole year and you can still afford to eat and do things. Um, we do advocacy and negotiation between residents and property managers. Uh, the housing court thing one is really interesting. When I first got into this, I would just sit at housing court all day because I wanted to kind of figure out what the tone of that was. Um, so when I first got there, they tried to evict about eight people and we were pretty good. They didn't get any of them out of the building. So then they stopped trying to evict people and we had to go like, oh, maybe you should try to get some people out like when they've actually done something. So now when they, when they think they're gonna evict someone, they call us uh, and ask us if we've talked to the person, if they can set up a meeting where we can help them understand why the person might not be paying their rent. Um, and also just, you know, Sometimes people don't like people in authority, especially if you've been homeless for a while and the property manager dresses up in like a pantsuit. And so sometimes people just say things to her that they don't really mean, but they say it anyway. So just trying to make sure everybody's like, basically just trying to keep it as cool as possible. Um, and, and we also try to move people out of the building. Uh, it's small, really small units. And a lot of homeless folks have been told that they should just take what they have and that's their lot in life forever. But actually, they're eligible to stay on the uh, Section 8 waitlist while they're with us. Uh, we're able to support people to get jobs. Um, so, you know, when people start to make money, we try to find them a better option. And we also work the waitlist. So people who are on the waitlist, we continue to try to help them find housing. Um, and connections to community resources. We've done uh, events with visiting nurses and all sorts of things to try to help people out where we could. Our successes, uh, we reduce the eviction rate. For almost two years, we didn't have an eviction. Uh, people left because they wanted to. Uh, and then there was a fist fight and I couldn't fight that one, but um, we really, you know, evictions are actually expensive and that's our biggest talking point when we talk to the property manager is our, our lawyer, the lawyer for the building costs $120 an hour per case. So if you're trying to evict people uh, and you know it's gonna take a long time, it's actually kind of a waste of money if we could just work it out. Uh, increased health insurance, uh, increased access to an effective use of health services. Um, we've helped people to fire their psychiatrists when they've tried to over-medicate them. Uh, we've helped people get their visiting nurse to leave when their visiting nurse has been inappropriate with them. Um, and just, you know, we're, we're able to, it's, it's weird because people see, us, see me as more professional than I am, so I'm able to call bullshit in a way that I think is helpful. Um, increased sense of community among tenants. We really do try to empower them to understand that if they want change in the building, the way the building, the building rules, uh, their best bet is to work together. Um, reduce conflict between, uh, increased connection to community resources. We talked about that. Um, increased awareness of and successful application of housing options. Uh, so the reality is in addition to the Rainville support, my cell phone number is listed on our website. And I think every year you guys make me like 200 cards and I just give them out to people. So I get about, in the winter, 30 to 40 calls a day from people looking for housing. And I'll do everything I can to help them to find that. Often it's not me doing the work, it's really connecting them with resources who have money who can help them. But um, we, I don't know, this summer we probably, you know, we got a, 
maybe 40 or 50 people in the housing this summer. Um, you know, we just try to help people to get off the streets if we can um, and improve quality of life. I don't know, that, that's, a, that's true, but I don't know how to say that. And that's the end of my slideshow. So, yeah. So, so there's a lot of really complicated stuff that doesn't fit into a slideshow about this. Uh, it's been really interesting because uh, the folks we have working there have all been homeless. So um, one of the real values of, of what we do is not really us knowing something more than people, but like just trying to find out where the shortcuts exist, kind of just like peer support. Like there's a lady who works at our local HAP office who's really terrible and she only works on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we don't send people to HAP on Tuesdays and Thursdays because she does it, she's just not nice. Uh, we really do try to support people to, to find where they can go. And, um, and when we go to housing court, like because we know the law, we, I work with uh, alongside a law firm called uh, Heisler Feldman, who was really prominent in the housing crisis. And so they don't take many cases, but sometimes they will just like take someone for a day in court and they're really good, so if they appear on the docket with someone, sometimes everything disappears because because they, in Massachusetts, you can bill for your hours, so they will, even if they lose, like, even if they'll win, because they're really good, and then they will bill you for a ridiculous amount of money that the people they're suing could never have gotten together. So they're, sometimes they're able to do that for us. Um, they're able to help us with slumlords when people are living in really unsanitary conditions. Um, yeah, and so it's really, uh, it's been really interesting. I think we're, we're just about to grow. Remember when I told you about the terrible why? So we're gonna be going there and hopefully trying to figure some of that stuff out. Um, we just got a big grant, kind of our biggest grant uh, from the Miller Foundation, uh, which I wasn't sure we were gonna get, but we did. And so we're gonna be doing some trainings and working on a handbook and uh, just trying to spread the idea because it's not a super complicated way of doing it really. You just gotta find the people who know the tricks and connect them with the people who need the tricks. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting work. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. So uh, would you be comfortable telling how you got from being homeless? Yeah. Homeless? yeah, so how I got homeless is interesting. I worked two jobs. I, uh, in the mornings I cleaned kitchen equipment at a restaurant. And in the afternoons, I waited tables at a private dining restaurant, like a, like a fancy place. I had to wear a cummerbund at one of those places. And, uh, but I didn't have a bank. Uh, I'm somebody who kind of grew up in psych wards and things like that. People had never explained to me kind of money and how that works. So I always had like my money in my wallet. And so I cashed my check. I had my money in my wallet. I went to go do my laundry. And I put my wallet underneath my clothes while I went to get dish, uh, soap. And when I came back, my wallet was gone. And it was all the money I had in the world. And uh, I was living with my sister. Uh, she kind of wanted rent every week. I couldn't give it to her, so she kicked me out. And uh, it was really quick. It was uh, kind of almost like one night I became homeless. And uh, that was really a hard spot for me because I couldn't lose the jobs because they were the only source of income I had. So I had to take the money I did have coming in and spend a lot of it to not look homeless. So I had to pay for like a YMCA membership so I could use the shower in the morning. Uh, I had to buy like really awful clothes so that I didn't go into the park in a cummerbund because that wouldn't have worked well for me. Um, I got pretty sick in that period. I ended up getting a really bad staph infection uh, on my back and I got a really high fever and I would, what ended up happening is I, uh, I used to go to 12 step meetings and there was this girl who wasn't doing good at 12 step stuff. She just kind of smelled like weed and listened to fish all the time, but she let me live with her. Like she let me sleep on her couch for a few months and get my stuff together. And, uh, and I was really fortunate in that event because somebody kind of took me in and allowed me to, to just stay there. That kind of kindness isn't really common. I didn't choose to go to the shelter uh, because it's terrible. And if I had gone to the shelter, it would have been a lot harder. Everybody knows where the shelter is. It's in an isolated section of town. It's right next to the police station. Um, so in going there, I would have outed myself as being homeless, which would have kind of made me untouchable in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, it's weird because I think that's a, a part of homelessness people don't think about is I kind of always had money, but I couldn't get a first, last, and security together. Uh, and I also, like, I couldn't, 
it's not like I could buy food and put it in a fridge, so I had to go to like fast food places. I knew I was paying more money for food than I would have been. And it just kind of felt like quicksand. Like the more I tried to get out of being homeless, the more kind of deeply entrenched I was in being homeless. And, uh, and yeah, so it, that was like October to February of 2009, 2010. And uh, yeah, and it was just, it was a really awful time. I'll be honest, like I, one of the good things about being in a psych ward for being homeless is I had learned to be brutal in brutal situations, but it was just a really awful, at one point I was jumped and I had some money taken from me and I had some, I got kicked in the face, I had some teeth broken. Uh, it was just a really, but nobody cares. Like it's not, what are you gonna call the police and tell them you're illegally living in the park and someone did something to you? Uh, the police go through the park, so they will cut tents, so I couldn't have a tent. I slept, uh, there's a duck pond and they have benches that are like against the wall and I would sleep under the bench because people didn't sleep there because it was a terrible spot to sleep. Uh, but I knew I wouldn't be messed with if I was there. So yeah, I don't, I wish I'd had resources then, but navigating all the resources, uh, A, I made too much money for some of them. I couldn't have gone to DTA, I had a job. Um, I would have had to lose my job and been out of it for a couple months to get support. Um, and the shelters were brutal, so I just couldn't get to them. So it was, a, it was a hard spot, yeah. Thank you. Um, and coming back to this work, um, how did you come to the work that you're doing now? Yeah, so I, yeah, I, um, I never wanted to do any of this work ever. Like I, I was in uh, Elmcrest in Connecticut and there was a, a kid who was killed there. I was at the hospital when that happened. Um, and I spent most of my teen years in hospitals. So I kind of really prided myself on not having anything to do with this shit ever again. Um, and so it meant how I had kids, which I think people is a really underrated way of becoming responsible for some people. Uh, I had kids and that made things change for me. And I was a stay at home dad for two years. Uh, my daughter went to school. I had to find something to do. People had been telling me about the RLC for a long time but I wouldn't go because it sounded like a scam. It just sounded like every time somebody ever described a place where they're like, no, people are really nice to you, it ended with me going to the hospital. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm not going to that. Uh, and then I showed up and I did some volunteer trainings and, uh, and they had a, there was a center, there is a center in Springfield called the Bowen, in Springfield, Mass, uh, the Bowen Resource Center. And I started going there and I really liked the people. It's just a really, it's like just a guttural spot. Like people, it, there wasn't often a lot of discussion about like emotional distress. It was just like people had like these really urgent needs and so I could support them to work through it. And uh, this was kind of my language. I understood like that things were really messed up. And, uh, and so that's kind of how I ended up in the work. The housing work was absolutely nothing I was interested in. Like I didn't know anything about it. I didn't think I could. Um, but when we agreed to it, I kind of just said, I'll figure it out. So for a while, I would just go to the Rainville every day and sit there. Some days I would go to housing court and sit there. I would meet with lawyers when I could. And I just tried to get as much of a, an understanding of the law. So um, yeah, so like two and a half years later, I know most of the players. Like when I go to the courthouse, I know whose hand to shake, who doesn't like me. Uh, and all those things which are real. Someone should not like you everywhere you go. Um, so yeah, it, all the work was really, uh, I really love, I love peer support. And I think I love the idea that uh, you know, you can try to really work with people from a place of like, no, my life was hard and this is how it stopped being hard or this is how I dealt with it being hard. Um, I also now work for a really traditional provider and so that I'm, uh, I'm like a, as a program director, so that's really changed things a little bit because now I kind of see the systemic stuff that like people are told is really unintentional, but like kind of we have these conversations about like it's really messed up to do this to someone and then we do it. And like I've been in those meetings where it's like, oh no, we all agreed not to do that. But now some, like they're at the state hospital, like how did that happen between here and there? Uh, so yeah, I, um, yeah, it's, it's been an, a weird circuitous route, but I got here. Yeah, and yeah. And so I kind of have to take it back to how it started, which was that housing training. Right. Arise for Social Justice is an organization that was started by uh, welfare mothers in the city who were being charged a tax on their food stamps 
Uh, so like they were being charged like a quarter to the dollar to uh, use their food stamps in the city. And this was kind of an agreed upon practice. And at some point they went, well, that doesn't add up. This is actually supposed to help us dig out of the hole. Right. Now we owe money. Um, so they organized around that. And so this is a, a group of people that are really committed to stopping injustice where they see it. So they, to, for Massachusetts to get a lot of these housing laws, things that were done were like, bring homeless people to the state house day. Like, do not ignore us. Like, and we're not like we're gonna hold a rally, but the state house is public grounds. People can go walk around the state house all day. And that makes a real impact if you have 5,000 people who are homeless walking around the state house, which is their right. So just making it an issue that was unavoidable. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's kind of the way you get housing stuff. Like New York City is actually one of the other three spots that's a right to shelter place, uh, whether that's ideal or not. The other place is DC. Um, but th like, so then the, they did the housing, the Know Your Rights workshop because um, they would see these landlords doing really horrible things to people and they would just have no recourse. Um, and then, Kind of my thing of doing the trainings was really just a conversation thing. Like I, when I was started doing the housing work, I still worked in the center. And so when people would come in and talk about housing, uh, we would kind of have this ongoing uh, narrative of like, you know, they actually can't touch your stuff. Like they actually can't come into your house when you're not there. It's actually not their business if you get sick or uh, if you have a sexual partner. That's actually not their business. Um, and so in working with people, it just kind of, like most of this is just stuff that I kind of say to people like as we're talking. And I think it's just kind of saying the things that people, you know, just, so yeah, I don't really, I don't really see myself as a trainer. That's why you never see me at the R other RLC training offerings that happen. Cause I don't, I'm not, I don't get super psyched about that, but I do think with the housing stuff, people have to know that they, they do have rights, even in areas where there's not a lot of them. Like when I was looking at the Colorado rights, it's really not great. Like I say that, I guess judgmentally, like the fact that like it just recently changed to away from 10 days notice. In, in Massachusetts, there's, you have to give 14 day notice to even take someone to court. So you give the 14 day notice, it expires. It's gonna be another two weeks before you get in there. You're mandated to have mediation. The landlord has to have one mediation session. So that buys you another month. And then when you go in there, if you have a disability, you have a psych history, you're entitled to this thing called tenancy preservation, which is another group of people who come in and they can recommend reasonable accommodations. They have to be taken because they work for the court. That could be something like, and this happened, we had someone who, uh, in a different building, was hearing voices and sometimes would be screaming at them. A reasonable accommodation was to move them to a different unit. Uh, they had somebody in the building who was deaf uh, to move them next to the person who was deaf. Uh, and, but tenancy preservation is able to look at it on that sort of complex level and work through it. Um, and so then when you actually get to the judge, the judge is allowed to be compassionate. The judge is encouraged to be compassionate. So if he's looking at you and you're saying, I didn't pay the rent because I lost my job, and he is encouraged by the law to say, you know what, I'm gonna give you some time, right? And uh, so you'll see things like a landlord say, I want them out next week and the judge say, well, give them 90 days. And it's very rare, it's, there's a lot of ways to not get a, an eviction on your, your record. So then I look at other states that don't have that and I don't know how it works because those protections fall through all the time. They fail all the time, uh, but they're there. And I can't imagine what it looks like when they're not there. Like, uh, we, you cannot, they have a thing, it was called an uncon, yeah, yeah, they had a thing here called an unconditional notice to quit. That's not language you'll ever hear in Massachusetts. Nothing is unconditional. They're actually looking at changing the law so you can't have a no cause eviction. So to evict someone, you must bring a cause, you must bring a reason. One of the things that's really good is, people, there's two types of eviction, no cause eviction you can't really fight. It's like you live in my unit, I just want the unit back, I just need it back. Um, but they're actually, in the next two years, I expect they'll change the law so that you always have to bring cause. And if they inject cause into it, so like if your landlord sends you a letter saying, I'm trying to evict you because your food smells and it's smelling up the hallway, but then they file for a no cause eviction, that letter injects cause. So then it makes the case much more complicated. So it's, it's really complicated. Like when we were, in, we were in Maine at NARPA, it was really hard because their laws are a little bit more, like they're for the landlord, which is the capitalist way to do it, right? The landlord is the person who pays taxes, that's the one you support. Um, 
But in Massachusetts, it didn't work for us. Like a big part of it was the foreclosure crisis. A lot of smart people wrote laws into that piece of legislation. So like you can't be foreclosed on if they don't have your title. Uh, but if you live in a place and the landlord gets foreclosed on and he doesn't tell you about it, which happens all the time, you don't, they, the bank can't say, no, you're out. You become a tenant of the bank. So now the bank is responsible for all those same rights you would have had if they were a landlord, including keeping the heat and hot water on. And so, you, you know, even in those places, you don't lose your rights. Um, that your, once your tenancy is established, it can't be terminated without a court order. So I definitely hear you know, you're right. Yeah. So you're right. Trans yeah. Know who can help you. Having lawyers who are willing to help. I don't know what the laws are here, but in Massachusetts, there's triple damages. So if a landlord charges you an illegal fee and you take them to court, they can be forced to pay you three times, whatever that is. So the law firm can also recoup that money. So if you can find out how a law firm could potentially make a profit off of it, lots of law firms will take it if they can make money. And then they can also make the I'm a super good person argument. Yeah. Uh, and so like finding lawyers, finding legislators who care about homeless people. Um, and often I would find the person whose office is closest to where homeless people stay. Because they're often the one who's like, yeah, no, I will sign any bill that removes those people <laughs> from in front of my office. And, and just, and be as, and share the good things with them. You know, share like when you have successes. I guess I'll stop with this. One of our biggest successes at the Rainville was, uh, we have a guy who, his name's Muhammad. I told him I would share his story, but he, um, and we talked about it. He, when I moved in the building, he was the only person who wasn't on a subsidy. He's from Egypt and he wasn't a citizen. Uh, and they had moved him in kind of like, we like you, but they had to make him pay the, the, like the market value rent. Uh, because they weren't getting any subsidies. So he was paying $650 a month for a 111 square foot unit. And he couldn't work above the board. So it was just a real struggle for him. And he's gonna get naturalized like next week. And he did all that himself. Like when I say the support we do, most of it is that people know the answers already themselves. They just need someone to say like, you could, like you can, you can do it. Like, and I don't mean like kind of pat on the back stuff, but like, yeah, you have a right to do better. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Thank you.